So, ladies and gentlemen, as you heard in the introduction, and as I'm sure you are aware of by now, George Zimmerman was found not guilty in the murder of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. Since I heard the verdict uh, through this very moment where I'm talking to you right now, I still have just uh, this feeling of, of sickness in my stomach, just the sadness, the, the helplessness when you know that justice has been denied. And it's easy, you know, it's easy for us to be sad. And, and, and you should be. You should be sad. You should be angry. You should be mad. You should be furious about this. We're going to go into further details in just a bit on the show with the nation's Michael Denzel Smith, uh, because there's so many, so many angles and so much that is so, so wrong with this entire, uh, this entire story, this entire uh, thing that's going on from from individual racism to societal racism, institutionalized racism, uh, to the laws. Really quickly, uh, Think Progress actually has a post that has some statistics. If you somehow were living under a rock and don't believe in institutionalized racism, most likely if you don't believe in institutionalized racism, you're probably not living under a rock. You're probably living under a sheet, a white sheet with a pointy hood. Um, I, you know, I'm being glib here, but, but this is stuff that, that people, we should remind ourselves of this here. So here's a few quick stats from Think Progress. Uh, quote, A black male born in 2001 has a 32% chance of spending some portion of his life in prison. A white male born in the same year has a 6% chance. There, you heard it. 32%. 32%. That's over over 3 out of 10. More statistics real quick here. African Americans who use drugs are more than four times as likely to be incarcerated than whites who use drugs. Black students are three and a half times as likely to be suspended or expelled than their white peers. Black youth who referred to juvenile court are more likely to be detained, referred to adult court, or end up in adult prison than their white counterparts. Lastly, the United States imprisons a larger percentage of its black population than South Africa did at the height of apartheid. So that's pretty good company, huh? The United States and apartheid-era South Africa partners in imprisonment. Way to go. Way to go, USA. And we're gonna go, we're gonna go into the racism angle of this more in just a bit, like I said, but I want to focus here at the top of the show on the law side, on the stand your ground law itself. So many pundits, many pundits were claiming that it played no role at all in the trial itself. Obviously it played a role in the fact that, you know, Zimmerman wasn't arrested for 40 some days, but the, so many pundits are saying, oh, it didn't have anything to do with the trial. It didn't have anything to do with the trial. That my friends is absolutely positively not true at all. Media Matters and a couple other sources actually posted the actual instructions that the jury was read before they went to deliberate the case. And I'm going to read I'm going to read them to you. Again, these are the actual jury instructions. Quote: In deciding whether George Zimmerman was justified in the use of deadly force, you must judge him by the circumstances by which he was surrounded at the time force was used. The danger facing George Zimmerman need not have been actual. However, to justify the use of deadly force, the appearance of danger must have been so real that a reasonably cautious and prudent person under the same circumstances would have believed that the danger could be avoided only through the use of that force. Based upon appearances, George Zimmerman must have actually believed that the danger was real. If George Zimmerman was not engaged in an unlawful activity and was attacked in any place where he had a right to be, 
be, he had no duty to retreat and had the right to stand his ground and meet force with force, including deadly force, if he reasonably believed it was necessary to prevent death, great bodily harm to himself or another, or to prevent the commission of a forcible felony, end quote. Again, understand your ground. There doesn't need to be an actual threat. As long as Zimmerman believed that he was threatened, he can fire away. And, you know, there's, this also is not just stand your ground. There's also a lot of, you know, different states have some pretty crazy self-defense laws when it's not actually self-defense. But Media Matters actually posted what the jury instructions were before stand your ground was signed into Florida law. And I'm going to read those those here right now. Again, the following that I'm reading right now is what the instructions would have been to the jury if stand your ground was not the law in Florida. Again, this is what would have been read if stand your ground was not the law. Quote, the defendant cannot justify the use of force likely to cause death or great bodily harm unless he used every reasonable means within his power and consistent with his own safety to avoid the danger before resorting to that force. The fact that a defendant was wrongfully attacked cannot justify his use of force likely to cause death or great bodily harm if by retreating he could have avoided the need to use that force. End quote. That's a little different, isn't it? That's a little different than the first one I read, isn't it? Let me read that part again. Quote, the defendant cannot justify the use of force likely to cause death or great bodily harm unless he used every reasonable means within his power and consistent with his own safety to avoid the danger before resorting to that force. George Zimmerman stalked an innocent, unarmed child. He stalked and killed an innocent, unarmed child. In no way, shape, or form is stalking a child avoiding the danger before resorting to force. That is creating the j- the danger. George Zimmerman created the danger and then he killed an innocent, unarmed child. So the instructions on stand your ground versus no stand your ground, they're different. They are different. We can't deny that. Can we know for certain that the jury might have gone the other way? No, no, of course we can't. We don't know that. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. You know, again, uh, individual societal racism is still there. Institutionalized racism is still there. We don't know. But that brings me back to... What were we saying at the beginning? The sadness and the anger. Trayvon is dead. Many Trayvons have been killed since Trayvon was murdered. More, more will die. We have to channel the sadness and the anger and the emotion into action. And, 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 and people have. I mean, you know, look, this last weekend, we literally saw... Thousands of people protest all over the country, from New York City to California to Boston to Chicago. Thousands and thousands of people taking to the streets, expressing their sadness and anger and frustration at justice denied here in the United States. And as sad as as sad as it is and horrible as it is, we really need to try to not let this this moment pass. We need to try and not have had this innocent kid to have been murdered for absolutely nothing. We'll be right back. <laughs> 